Hello, everybody. Welcome. Here I am, Doug Bradburn, President and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon, in a special place today to have our conversation. This is George Washington's Presidential Library. Uh, formal name is the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. And this place opened uh, at Mount Vernon in the fall of 2013, uh, September 27, 2013, to be exact. And it is George Washington's own presidential library. Now, it's unlike the other presidential libraries that you might know out there because it isn't managed by the National Archives system. It is completely part of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association's operations of Mount Vernon. Uh, so it's a center for research created to study the legacy and life of George Washington and the revolutionary era. And it's because of the great investments in research that the Mount Vernon Ladies Association has made really throughout their history, but certainly in, the, in this recent epoch uh, that allows us to do a lot of these digital programs that we've been doing with you all all the expertise we have on hand, uh, and, and in fact, is a place that gathers scholars together that provides opportunities for scholarship. We have uh, research fellows who normally, in normal times, would work out of this building. We have a great collection of rare books and manuscripts of George Washington, which in some future conversation, I, I'm going to bring you into the Holy of Holies in this temple to George Washington and visit with his own, his very own books and some of his manuscripts. But that's just something you'll have to look forward to. Uh, we also, out of this library, do leadership programs, a lot of programs for corporate groups, military groups, student groups, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, and others, uh, where we help explore the lessons that you can learn from George Washington's extraordinary leadership. And leadership is something you can study, and it is something you can benefit from, uh, and particularly learning uh, from the lives of other people who've led in challenging times. So I personally, uh, throughout this COVID crisis have leaned a lot on the legacy of George Washington. And it is a fascinating story as we've been exploring over the last few weeks together. So I look forward to taking your questions today about George Washington's final years uh, in retirement. Uh, we think of it as his retirement. Uh, it is his final uh, act uh, in a life that was uh, always on a public stage as he would often compare it to. A, a, a stage uh, as a great metaphor for the world. And he was playing out his own role uh, in the public eye for most part of that uh, uh, extraordinary life. And we know he had these kind of two periods of, of retirement. The first after the American Revolutionary War in which he gave up his commission and came back to Mount Vernon. And in fact, in this room uh, behind me, this is the great Karen Bookhold Wright reading room at Mount Vernon. Uh, this is where you would be if you were working in, in, uh, in the library on your research project, um, sitting at one of these beautiful tables, being uh, watched by the founding fathers of the United States here. And if you follow me around, I don't know if the camera lens, lens is wide enough, but you basically have uh, Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington back there, and then John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, James Madison right here. Uh, and so Washington is depicted here as he would have looked in 1785, which is in the period after his first retirement, because the bus was uh, made to look, uh, it, it was started with the bus by Jean-Antoine Houdon, uh, which was done by the artist himself here at Mount Vernon in 1785. And this is a, a beautiful rendering of what Washington would have looked like in that period, drawing on that bus. Uh, by Studio Ice in Brooklyn, uh, Ivan Schwartz, an incredible artist who put that together for us. And then the idea was that all the other founding fathers should look like they looked in 1785. And so they're all kind of trapped in amber in this one moment where they're uh, together uh, at last in 1785, sort of in perpetuity. And I always find it as a, a really interesting teaching moment to talk about that year and these busts because it's before the, dec before the Constitution, before the Constitutional Convention, but after independence was won, uh, really at a time of great ambiguity, a, a time when they don't know what the future holds for uh, their experiment in independence. Uh, and it does take the leadership of this group and many others to form that more perfect union together. So George Washington's first retirement was a bit of a bust, right? So he thought he would roll down uh, the stream of life uh, and, and until he reaches the shades of his father's uh, you know, uh, under his own vine and fig tree, which he famously wrote about uh, in that period. 
But of course, he's called back. They pull him back in. He's needed to be there as president of the Constitutional Convention. And then he has to serve as the first president uh, under that constitution that they created. And of course, we've talked about those two terms. First one, he's going to setting up the government. And you see really the, the beginnings of that split in his cabinet between Jefferson and, and uh, Madison. I'm sorry, Jefferson and, and uh, Hamilton uh, uh, over the, you know, the vision for the country. And then very quickly gets drawn into the international politics of the French Revolution, uh, which dominates his second term, in which you have the British and the French really uh, being... Um, you know, you know, a polarizing idea of the different parts of America uh, in this in this worldwide crisis, and Washington tries to steer that middle course. And of course, one of the final acts of his presidency uh, in, in his second term is his farewell address that he gives to the nation. And as I mentioned briefly in my last uh, conversation with you, is the farewell address is really all about unity and union. I mean, that is. You know, if somebody asks you, what was George Washington's farewell address really about? It's about union. It's an emphasis uh, to the American people that they should recognize the things that they share. They're not Easterners or Westerners. They're not Southerners or Northerners. Don't let anybody uh, pretend that these are your most important interests and your identities. Your true name of American is what you are. And, and in fact, it's a, it's a great statement it, when it appears in print, usually in those 18th century newspapers, a message from George Washington would say Philadelphia or Mount Vernon, where he was, you know, it'd be kind of dateline Philadelphia, a message from the president. But this one just said the United States. And it reflects that idea that the, the, that the, the emphasis was on that was the important place that Washington was speaking to posterity from. Uh, and so union is crucial in that, in that document, not only the sectional idea that you're all one people, that your interests are shared, but that really only together will you survive as a community, as a nation, uh, that that unity was essential and there were other threats to it. Uh, it wasn't just this idea of, of regional identity, it was also the danger of partisanship. Extreme partisanship would also tear you apart, you know, and you would come to see the other as aliens. Uh, you know, if you get so enwrapped in your own ideas about what is the right thing for the country so that you see fellow citizens as enemies of the country or as aliens indifferent to the interests of the country, that could lead to a massive rift as well. So there's a danger to extreme partisanship that Washington warned against. And then, of course, there's all the stuff in there about foreign influence. Beware of foreign influence. If you, you should make commercial treaties with all, but not many political treaties. Be, be very wary of long-term political relationships with other countries. And remember that as much as you might love France or England as their culture, they have their own interest and the United States has its own interest. And they're not just gonna be nice to you as a country um, because you love each other. That, that be wary about these, these long-term relationships with, which can come to skew your interest. But if you do have political treaties and relationships with other countries, you have to live up to them. The honor of the country is essential. So this message of the farewell address is really his last great public statement to the people. But in fact, he does quite a bit more, you know, on his transition to retirement. Uh, in fact, on his last day in office, he's working on defending his reputation from letters that have been published uh, by Benjamin Franklin Bash, who is Benjamin Franklin's grandson. Uh, who was a publisher and printer in Philadelphia of the, um, of the Aurora, a really aggressive um, uh, newspaper which attacked the Washington um, administration in its final years, accused Washington of being pro-British. It had, you know, they had gotten an early copy of the Jay Treaty and printed that and it created all this chaos. And Bash had printed these letters, these forgeries of letters that George Washington wrote or, well, didn't write, but they, they were claimed to have been written by him during the American Revolution. And they depicted Washington as a very tepid patriot, in fact, almost a half loyalist, so pro-British, because that was the point that Bash was wanting to make, was that George Washington has always been pro-British. I mean, even during the war, we think of him as fighting against the British for eight years, but even during the war, he was pro-British. And so these were absolute forgeries. They were forgeries used during the war and then they were reprinted as if they were true. So Washington in almost his last day in office in the presidency is attacking and giving proofs of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, the forgeries and of, of uh, showing that they weren't correct. So Washington's involved in the politics to the very last minute. 
himself. And it's uh, and it is hard for him to escape that, as we'll see, even in retirement. But one thing I do want to mention on that transition from president of the United States, most powerful political figure in the country, to private citizen, uh, it was really remarkable uh, when George Washington made it clear that he was going to be present at the inauguration of John Adams. Uh, you would see, you would witness something that nobody in America had ever seen in their lifetime. Uh, and had, you know, hadn't really been seen anywhere in a long time, which is uh, a sovereign authority uh, transitioning in a peaceful way to another person uh, while to both men are still alive. So it wasn't the death of the king that leads to the next king, but rather a, a living man stepping away from power and then that power being peacefully transitioned to another one as a representative of the people. This was a remarkable thing, and it's a legacy that we uh, get to benefit from. Uh, that peaceful transition has happened, you know, since George Washington stepped down in 1797 from the office of the presidency. So he steps down. John Adams writes about it. He's very nervous about it. Uh, he, he writes that uh, Washington is delighted that he's no longer, uh, you know, the president and all these cares are going to fall on John Adams. And uh, Adams imagines, you know, a conversation actually between them, which is dramatized in the miniseries on John Adams, if you've seen that, where uh, he, they actually have Washington saying the words that Adams writes in his diary. He believes that the look on Washington's face is expressing these words. Uh, so Adams, once again, uh, kind of uh, changing the story a little bit, but it's interesting uh, because they, that moment is very clearly written about when Adams has his own inauguration. And Washington leaves Philadelphia as quickly as he can traveling back to Mount Vernon, and that takes him about a week. And it's a tedious week from George Washington's point of view, because you know riding in a carriage in the 18th century on 18th century roads is, is tedious, um, but also because he keeps being greeted by every, in every town he goes to, there's a whole collection of militia that come marching out and they want him to review the troops. And he's got to continue to play this role that he's trying to escape from, you know, to get back to Mount Vernon, back to where he feels is his home, back to his real passions of agriculture. And he knows that you know, he, he's, he's got lots of work to do. So uh, he arrives at Mount Vernon, and this will be in March of 1797. Uh, and he writes a letter uh, after being on the estate, surveying what needs to be done, realizes there's a lot of work uh, that had been neglected over the eight years he had had his mind mostly focused on the presidency. Even though he had been back to Mount Vernon, he never had the time to escape his presidential duties while he was here in the way that he would, when he, he had left them. And he's seen a lot of uh, degradation of the estate. Uh, some of the farms haven't been managed that well, even though he gives weekly advice when he's in the presidency by letter. Um, many of the outbuildings needed lots of repairs. A sheep flock, for instance, uh, was producing half the amount of wool that it was when he went to the presidency. So his uh, husbandry had not been cared for with a good eye. Uh, you know, his animal stock had kind of gone to, to, to pot. And he writes a letter to James McHenry, his secretary, of, well, former secretary of war, in which he says, I am surrounded by the sounds of hammering uh, and the odors of paints. He writes, I have uh, no more buildings to build but one, although all the rooms in Mount Vernon were being worked on, upgraded, but no more buildings to build but one, which will house his military, civil, and public papers, which are voluminous and may be interesting which is, of course, the most humble brag in the world. Of course, they're interesting. They are the history of the country that he has given birth to, uh, those papers, those papers that he cared so deeply about. And we like to say here at Mount Vernon, when we were raising the money privately to build this incredible building uh, and, and all the programs that we can do out of it, that this is what Washington had in mind, a presidential uh, house for his uh, for his papers and, and Maybe not quite on this scale, but uh, nevertheless, he wanted us to build this and we got it done in uh, 2013. So I had a question about his retirement. Uh, Matt, it was about, uh, he was, was he able to secure his retirement uh, the way he wanted? And I think that's how we'll kick it off here. Yeah, Doug, so Kathy would like to know, uh I caught Matt unawares there. But the question was essentially, um, 
Was George Washington able to find in his retirement, his final retirement, the peace of mind and the uh, uh, and, and the, the leisure that he was looking for, or was he constantly interrupted in different ways? And, and do his journals or papers help us understand this thing? And so I just mentioned his papers, and he wanted to build this house for his papers. So let's take a quick walk over to see how we know what we know about George Washington's final years and all his years. And here we are in front of an incredible wall of, uh, of his papers, uh, which is uh, on two sides. One is the writings of Washington, which were done by the George Washington Bicentennial Commission and published in the 1920s and 30s. But then the definitive edition of his papers, his correspondence, the Papers of George Washington Project, which began in 1968, uh, funded in part by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, um, and now comprises all these volumes you see from the, the, uh, the, the black with the little circles in them. So at the very top there, the colonial period, so his early life, then you have the Revolutionary War, his retirement after the war, his presidential series in red here, and then his retirement series down here. But also all of his diaries as well have been professionally transcribed and annotated. Now this is a project which is one of the great hallmarks of uh, scholarship that this country has ever produced. So, you know, here's a presidential series volume of George Washington's from June to September 1789. So the first year of his presidency. And you can see, uh, I mean, that's June to September. Uh, that's a couple of months, right, in that one year. And what this volume contains is all of the letters that George Washington wrote and all the letters he read during that period, in addition to different account books and other lists and that sort of thing, perfectly uh, transcribed from the best copies that could be found everywhere in the world, but also annotated so that when it lists a person, you know, or an event or a thing, you, you can see in the footnotes what that's referring to, like who was Ralph Izzard, who was Abraham Locke, who are these random people that George Washington is referencing. So transcribed, annotated, professionally edited, published in letterpress volumes, uh, which is an extraordinary achievement. And this is how all those great scholars are able to write all these books that we so admire out there. And I hope they all recognize that they're standing on the shoulders of a lot of hard labor, uh, a project that's still ongoing. Uh, they won't complete the final editions of the Revolutionary War series uh, until uh, sometime in, in this decade, I hope, 2020s. Um, but they have finished the retirement years. They have finished the presidency. I think the next volume is the final volume to come out soon. I think it's already done, but not quite out yet. And then uh, the, last, the last series to do is the Revolutionary War. Series. So where, what was I, where was I going with all this? So, uh, so how do we know about what George Washington thought in his retirement? Well, we know from his own papers, his own journals. And, and um, the, the sad fact is, no, he did not get that peace and calm in his retirement. He was still connected very much to the maelstrom of party politics and international affairs that the country was a part of. He couldn't escape his reputation as the man, the father of the country. He had massive legions of fans who would descend upon Mount Vernon and visit him. And he actually had less control over that than he did when he was president. Because as president, at least he could keep people at bay begging off with his official duties. But as a retired citizen, he said to go by the protocols of Virginia hospitality for people of his rank, which he'd been you know, born into and had, and had, and had been a, you know, a part of his whole life. And so people would visit him here. He described the house uh, you know, as a well-resorted tavern. Uh, people still visited Mount Vernon. It was the spot in between uh, north and south, right along the main highway uh, that people could stop south of Alexandria. Plus, he had all these friends and admirers in the neighborhood. Uh, so, so no. So he really had a couple of big projects in his retirement years. Uh, one was his agricultural affairs. And he was a great agricultural reformer. He was always looking at ways to improve the ability of the lands at Mount Vernon and other lands he owned, uh, improve their ability to sustain themselves and, and bring him cash. He, he, of course, depended upon the labor of over 300 enslaved people who lived here at Mount Vernon, um, about half of whom he owned himself outright, and the other half, maybe a little more than half, were actually owned by the Custis Dower uh, slaves. And I do want to talk about slavery in this hour together. Um, particularly the will, uh, you know, his attempts to emancipate the, the slaves at the end of his life and the challenges that he faced regarding that. 
But also, you know, there were personal stories of slavery that Washington uh, would have been feeling very uh, pertinently as he revived, revived, uh, uh, arrived back in Mount Vernon. For instance, en route to Mount Vernon, he learned that the, his, his trusted and beloved uh, uh, cook, uh, Hercules, who was a slave, George Washington's slave, uh, had escaped, had run away from Mount Vernon. Uh, and Washington thought he was likely going back to Philadelphia, uh, where Washington had brought him uh, to be a chef in the presidential mansion when he became president in Philadelphia. And Hercules had learned uh, that Washington was being deceitful uh, in, in circulating slaves back from, from Philadelphia and Mount Vernon because Pennsylvania at that point was under uh, an emancipation law written in fact by Thomas Paine in 1782 in which if you brought a slave person to, to Pennsylvania, they would gain their liberty if they stayed longer than six months. And so Washington would cycle through his own personal slaves and Martha's slaves uh, from Philadelphia to Mount Vernon so that they would never gain uh, their liberty while they're there. And it's, uh, you know, it shows the, the rigors that Washington uh, went to as a slave owner, that this was property that he believed was his, uh, and he wanted to make sure that he secured it, particularly the dower slaves uh, who weren't his. I mean, he was the trustee of them, and he could be held liable uh, if any of those slaves, um, you know, ran away under his care. And, and that's an example of, of course, the famous story of Ona Judge, who was a dower slave who was one of Martha Washington's uh, maids, essentially, um, who worked very closely with her, who ran away from Philadelphia uh, and ended up escaping entirely as Hercules did as well. Hercules was never found, never caught. Uh, and Washington did send notice that if you find him in Philadelphia to send him to Mount Vernon on the ship that's bringing a lot of the presidential furniture and other, other baggage uh, after him. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's a really poignant story because Hercules did have a family at Mount Vernon. He had a daughter who was owned as part of the dower slaves. Uh, and she was fam famously asked by a group of Frenchmen who visited Mount Vernon, aren't you sad that your father has run away and is no longer here? And she, she famously said, as recorded by these French visitors, um, that she was happy because now he was free. Um, speaking, of course, to the, the tragic human uh, hypocrisy involved in slavery here at Mount Vernon in the early Republic of the United States. Uh, the, the antecedent to that story, of course, is that uh, antecedent, uh, precedent? No, it's the, uh, the, the, the whole collection of that story, though, is that Washington had uh, talked about and, and tried to find ways to free the slaves here at Mount Vernon. And he'd been trying really in earnest uh, and creative ways to do this as, as, probably as, as early as the mid-1780s. But really, the great evidence for it comes in the early 1790s when he tries to get English tenant farmers to come to Mount Vernon to rent his outlying farms and in the process of that sort of find a way to transition enslaved laborers into tenant farmers or sharecroppers over a period of time. This is a plan that never goes anywhere. Washington could never uh, find the right people or was never able to put it into effect. It's not clear if he was continuing to try to do that after he returned to Mount Vernon uh, after the presidency. And I think partly it's unclear because uh, there, well, there's no evidence that he was immediately trying to do this. Uh, there's also some evidence that he was trying to figure out ways to send some of the slave laborers to his, his Western properties, uh, and whether or not he imagined that he'd emancipate them there is not clear. Um, it's, also, it's also the fact that George Washington dies after only two years of, uh, after his retirement, basically. So he comes to Mount Vernon after retiring from the presidency in March of 1797, and he's dead by December of 1799. You know, so he lives the whole year of 1798 and the whole year of 1799, basically, and only half of the year of 1797 at Mount Vernon. And so whatever plans he had down the road uh, were not able to be put into train. Um, but of course, that, that will, uh, the last will and testament of George Washington was a remarkable document in that it did free uh, over 100 and 30 slaves who owned, were owned by George Washington here at, at Mount Vernon at the death of Martha. Uh, and so in the will, it became legal that they would be free uh, when Martha passed. And it also included another 30-odd slaves who lived 
at a different uh, estate he had down on the York River, which we know very little about, to be frank. Uh, but those folks were also freed uh, at the death of, of Martha. In reality, of course, Martha freed them a little early uh, under the, uh, the promises of the will, um, because there was a, a strong sense that with her death being the only thing between 130 people and freedom, uh, that she was she was afraid uh, that she you know might come to some early demise, uh, not entirely unheard of uh, in an environment where you're dependent upon all these other people for your very food and your existence. So, um, but not a very generous thought either. Uh, at any rate, uh, it was tragic because there was a separation then between the family that Washington could free and the dower slaves who were owned by the Custis estate, not owned by Martha, owned by the, the estate of her heirs. Uh, and so, we, and they would eventually go to them. Um, but what we do know is that in Washington's will, he provided for the education of those enslaved people under the age of 25. Uh, following the same rules that the orphan courts used in Virginia uh, to find them apprenticeships and find them trades, but also provided for uh, uh, money for those who were too old to work uh, as free people in Virginia. And we do know Washington's estate continued to pay out uh, those benefits until the 1840s at, at, uh, when, when the last of them uh, died. Uh, on the other hand, Washington's plans for the education of the youth, um, uh, the formerly enslaved youth, uh, really were not able to be enforced. The state of Virginia changed its rules about free African-Americans, free blacks, uh, after Gabriel's rebellion in 1801. And so they started clamping down on what these, these newly freed populations of African-Americans that are emerging in Virginia out of the revolutionary era because of emancipations that had happened like Washington's. Um, they clamp out, down on, on their movement, uh, on their ability to be educated. Uh, it's illegal to teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's illegal for them to take up all kinds of uh, trades. It's illegal for them to be masters of ships, for instance, on the Chesapeake. There's all kinds of rules that are put into place. And that really is the moment where the Virginia uh, planter aristocracy, the early 19th century, completely abandons really any promise of the revolutionary um, uh, op optimism that slavery could be ended because of the rhetoric of revolution and liberty. Uh, and so Washington dies before that happens. Uh, and it does, I think, designate a, a particular period in Virginia's history where there was opportunities created by revolution that really are closed out in the early 19th century. So we think about the crisis and, and the conflict of slavery and the revolution. I think of it as a period of, of opportunity that's shut down rather than a, uh, you know, rather than a simple story of hypocrisy. Because um, you do get this law passed in 1782, which is the first time that planters in Virginia are allowed to free slaves without a law from the assembly or the legislature of the, of the colony itself. That law is uh, taken away in 1806 in Virginia. So from 1782 to 1806, you have this, this period which is described in one Virginia newspaper as a partial emancipation of slaves. And what you get is a, a free black community that grows from approximately 5,000 in 1782 to about 50,000 in the whole Chesapeake by 1810, in the census of 1810. So it, it grows quite rapidly, uh, and, then, and then their freedom gets really shut down as the problem of revolution turns into a problem of, of citizenship, and as American citizenship starts to become really um, designated as for whites only into the in, in the beginning of the 19th century. So that's a bit of a, a side stretch, but it's a really important part of Washington's retirement years and how that institution is sort of at play both here and at Mount Vernon uh, and also nationally as well. So uh, let's take another question, Matt, and I'll collect my thoughts on how to get into the political side of Washington's retirement. Yeah, Doug, Mary has been uh, on our website and came across Jane Anders James Anderson's bio and mm -hmm. uh, and particularly how he was helping uh, Washington to innovate agriculture here in Mount Vernon. Was he successful in that? Did Washington able to take some fruits of that? That's a great question about James Anderson and, and uh, as an estate manager. So Washington brings on James Anderson as an estate manager here in 1796-97. Uh, he's an immigrant from Scotland. Uh, and as an immigrant from Scotland, he was also involved in distilling uh, Scotch whiskey there, Scots whiskey. Um, in uh, in Scotland, and so here at Mount Vernon, he's the general estate manager, managing all the farms uh, 
and Washington corresponds with him. Washington has it set up in a very clear hierarchical way. That each farm has its own manager, and then it has overseers, uh, uh, you know, amongst the hands. And in many cases, these were actually enslaved people who operated as overseers in Washington's arrangements. And then also uh, so the, the, the estate manager themselves. So James Anderson was the estate manager, uh, and Anderson uh, was... Uh, was key in Washington's efforts to kind of make Mount Vernon as productive as possible. And one of the ideas that James Anderson brought to George Washington was the idea that he should be distilling whiskey here at Mount Vernon. And Washington was a little bit skeptical of this. He was a careful businessman. Uh, but Anderson convinced him, said, look, you've got grain, you've got water, you've got excess, you can make whiskey, which is a product in great demand. Any kind of distilled spirits are in great demand uh, in this age because water is still, you know, it's still not safe to drink all the time. People are putting spirits in a lot of their, uh, you know, their punches and, and other things. And, um, and Washington has James Anderson do a trial run where he produces a small batch uh, to see if there's a market for it, to see if it can be done. And it's a great success. Uh, this is why whiskey, as we would call it today, essentially, uh, all, we, we also might call it white lightning. It is, uh, it's not moonshine because it's not illegal, but it's, uh, it's, unaged uh, rye whiskey, it should be produced here in Mount Vernon and then sold in Alexandria. So basically 15 days after it's produced. So no aging uh, process in, in, in place there. And, and so Washington with Anderson's guidance then decided to build a big scale. He built a, a large distillery, certainly from the era, five stills in it. Uh, and by the end of his life, the last year of his life, that distillery produced 11,000 gallons of whiskey. Uh, I think it is the largest documented distillery that we can find in uh, in the United States uh, at the end of the 18th century. So think of that. George Washington was your largest distiller in the country, the father of American distilling, as well as the father of the country by, by his death. And Anderson was was crucial in that. Now Anderson stays on for only a couple of years after George Washington dies. In fact, we have a tremendous letter here, which one of our researchers really helped us uh, understand, in which James Anderson writes a letter to Martha, basically saying that, you know, first he's saying, I'm not going to be here next year, but he, but he lays out what the state of affairs are for Mount Vernon in that moment. And he points out that the Mansion House Farm is basically, the, the people in the Mansion House Farm are basically eating all of the profits of the other outlying farms. Essentially, all these visitors who are coming to Mount Vernon, uh, you know, and their slaves and their servants who came with them, uh, you know, and all the fodder that their horses needed, and all the all the the uh, produce that had to be, you know, basically produced, given to them as food. Uh, they were devouring uh, all the all the profits of all the outlying agricultural areas, and Mount Vernon could not sustain its own. Uh, hospitality, essentially. Uh, and so it's an interesting uh, letter because it gives us a really clear eye at one moment in time from Anderson's point of view of, of what, you know, what the limits of what you could do agriculturally here at Mount Vernon under its current organization. So this is a world that Washington would have known well in his retirement uh, period as he's trying to get every, you know, ounce of, uh, of profit out of this very challenging uh, agricultural environment. So Doug, Jeremy would like to know, uh, how did Washington's and retirement goals change from when he retired as serving in the Revolutionary War to then serving as president? It's a good question. How did Washington's retirement goals change? Well, at the one level, they didn't. Washington wrote almost the same letter when he finally was ensconced back here at Mount Vernon in 1797 that he wrote in early 1784, which is that I am now under my own vine and fig tree and I will be here until my death. So in that broader sense, he saw Mount Vernon as the place of his final ease and final resting place. Of course, this changes very dramatically in the 1780s because he immediately gets involved in this project potomac navigation company project to create this you know this company that can improve the navigation of the potomac into the west in his in his second retirement his his goal changed very rapidly as well because of the politics of the united states so when he left office you'll remember that they had americans had successfully passed a new treaty ratified a treaty with the British called the Jays Treaty, also a, a treaty with the Spanish, uh, which secured the border of the Southwest of the United States, 
uh, and it gave Americans uh, rights on the Mississippi. Washington had successfully subdued Native American tribes, either through diplomacy or war. Um, but there was one outlying problem, and that was their relations with the French. The French Directory, which, is, which was what was running the revolutionary nation of France at this time, was still very much at war with Great Britain. And they took the treaty that the Americans made with the British, the Jay Treaty, they took that as essentially an act of war. Um, Washington had foolishly sent James Monroe, who was a Jeffersonian Republican, sent him as the official ambassador to France to try to help work through this uh, conflict between French and, and the United States. Monroe was pro-French, uh, and he gave the French the wrong idea that, well, they really shouldn't spend their time you know, dealing with the American government. They should help support the growth of an opposition party and maybe then help get Thomas Jefferson elected president for an interference in a presidential election get him elected rather than make some kind of deal with the Americans. And so Washington pulled Monroe back, sent C.C. Pinckney, who was a Charleston uh, uh, Federalist, an old uh, hero of the American Revolution, probably one of the most respected men in the United States next to George Washington, someone we don't usually know much about today. But C.C. Pinckney was a really, really a phenomenal founder. Anyway, Pinckney, who's a Federalist, is sent to clean up Monroe's mess and the directory won't even really see I mean, he can't, he's basically kicked out of the country because the directory is so uh, anti-British uh, and anti-Washington's administration. The Jay Treaty has soured any relations they might have. And the French have made it clear that they're going to start basically um, allowing uh, their French ships to seize American shipping under the pretense that that shipping is helping supply war materials to the British and they're at war, so therefore the French can stop war materials. But it isn't just war materials. Of course, the French uh, uh, privateers uh, are, are basically seizing and attacking American uh, merchantmen sort of uh, without, you know, w without any, any restraint at all. So there's over 300 ships have been seized you know, by 1797, 90, uh, into, the, into the summer of 1797. And so what happens is George, you know, uh, when John Adams immediately becomes president, but Washington is on his way. Uh, there's a phone ring somewhere. Uh, Matt is going to, to answer it. If it's for me, I'll take it. Uh, anyway, so Washington is going back to um, uh, uh, Mount Vernon. J John Adams, as president, is calling an emergency session of Congress in May and gives a speech about the foreign uh, challenges. And in that, he announces that uh, we won't take any more of this from the French. We're not going to allow our shipping and our, our seamen to be, you know, uh, imprisoned and attacked uh, by this hostile nation. But at the same time, he held out the possibility of of a uh, of making a new deal. So he's going to create a new group that's going to go visit the French. C.C. Pinckney's going to be sent back because this idea that you can't recognize our official ambassador is not going to stand. Secondly, uh, John Marshall. It's going to go famous John Marshall, who will go on to become, of course, Secretary of State for John Adams, and then ultimately the first justice, of, well, not the first, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, where he'll sit for 30 years or so in the great Marshall Court. And the, but then Adams, being a guy who, like Washington, is trying to stand above party and is fairly moderate as it, when it comes to the Federalists. He's not a Hamiltonian. He doesn't like Hamiltonian finance. He's not pro-war like a lot of the Hamiltonians are. And so he, said, he says, well, I'm going to send a Republican in this mission. And that way, maybe the French will, will, you know, will, will behave. He sends Elbridge Jerry, uh, who famously, his name will later uh, uh, give us the thing gerrymandering when he's later governor of Massachusetts. But Elbridge Jerry is an old friend of John Adams from Massachusetts, an old revolutionary stalwart, but a Jeffersonian Republican. And so he sends him with these other Federalists as part of this trio that's going to negotiate with France. And we all know the history, don't we? Uh, they, get, um, they, they get asked to, to pay to play. The French minister, Talleyrand, you know, he, he was an old hand. And how you got access to the court uh, and access to power in the French was if you were a lesser power, is you've got to promise, you've got to give something. You know, you give some guaranteed loans, 
Uh, you're going to promise access to some trade markets even before you can, you know, get access to start negotiating. So this is an old pay-to-play, corrupt European diplomacy move, completely normal for France, which is this is the way they had done business. These American, you know, naifs, these are noobs at diplomacy. They are completely offended by this. Absolutely. This is an offense to national honor. It's an offense to their personal honor. They're never going to do this, uh, you know, and, and, and they, and they, uh, and they take the letters, uh, these famous letters between the ministers X, Y, and Z, whose names are crossed off and put Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z. These letters are then published in America showing that the French basically tried to get the Americans to pay to get access. And out of this comes the great slogan, uh, uh, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. That is the great slogan that comes out of this crisis, the X, Y, Z affair. This happens in the, in the winter and... Um, uh, of 1798, C.C. Uh, Pinckney and Marshall come back with the with the documents, give them to Adams. He has them published. The American people explode in nationalistic fervor and anger and uproar against the French. Elbridge Jerry stays back there in in France, you know, claiming that he can somehow work out a deal, which is ob obviously the wrong thing to do as well. So again, it seems like one party is pro-French. And, and then all the true Americans, the real Americans, are infuriated by the French and are ready to go to war. And it's in that legislative session in 1798. Washington's been home in Mount Vernon for a year. In that legislative session, the Federalists push through the Alien and Sedition Acts, a new naturalization policy, which extends the period that an alien has to live in the United States to become a citizen from five to 14 years, longer than it's ever been in American history. A 14-year wait in the 18th century is basically a death sentence. I mean, that's that's a way to make sure nobody who immigrates becomes a, a citizen. Um, 14 years, and then also create the new army, creates the the power to create an army, creates the passage of the law that allows Adams to to create an army. And guess who they want to be at the head of this army? Who is the most important general in the United States? Well, I think you know. I think you know, because we're here at Mount Vernon and we're talking about George Washington. George Washington, who's been retired and is now brought back in to public affairs as the commanding general of this new army that's going to be created to fight the French. It's unbelievable. There's no declaration of war. There are a number of extreme Federalists who are pushing for a declaration of war in that moment. The Adams faction, more moderate, you know, is, is going to wait and they're going to, and they're going to make an army first rather than too aggressively declare war before they're ready. They also start building ships. You know, they start building naval vessels as well in this period uh, and encouraging privateering. So the Americans and the French are now fighting what's called the quasi-war, right? The quasi-war is really a naval war between uh, American privateers and French privateers attacking each other's shipping. So it's basically a state of war at sea, but still undeclared peace. So this is an odd situation. Washington you know, is made this uh, lieutenant general now of commander-in-chief of the armies, despite the fact that the president is commander-in-chief. George Washington is given the title of commander-in-chief. And, and then you start to see the wrangling happen. Because Washington is like, look, I will do this because I've always done what my country has asked me to do. But I've got some stipulations. First, I don't have to leave Mount Vernon until there's actually an army in the field attacking the United States. Uh, so I can, I don't have to go and live in Philadelphia and build some army, but he does recognize he'll have to go there occasionally. Second, he gets to choose his own lead officers. Now, this is a challenge for Adam, who, as the president of the United States, believes he should be able to choose all the general officers, you know, all the major generals. And he wants Henry Knox, New Englander, and of course, a great general in the American Revolution, to have artillery, former Secretary of War friend of Washington's, he wants Knox to be his number two. So George Washington, then Henry Knox, and then after that, there's some other folks. Washington wants Alexander Hamilton. You know him from the musical. He wants Hamilton to be his right-hand man. He wants to get his right-hand man back. He's got to get his right-hand man back. He's going to get Hamilton back. Uh, in, in, in Hamilton, not only is going to be back, but he's going to be General Hamilton now, right? I mean, General Hamilton. Who's ever heard of that? He was a colonel uh, at best in the American Revolution, I think, at the end of it. 
Was he Colonel? At, at any rate, Knox had been a general. So how could Washington, you know, elevate Hamilton above Knox? I mean, this is appalling. Adams is furious, but Washington makes it clear that he's not going to serve if he doesn't get his way. And that rift is is really, really uh, astonishing and outrageous. It really explodes the authority of Adams as president. So here's Adams, you know, who's president of the United States. He's now been put in a position. If they actually go to war with France, he's going to lose all control to Washington and Hamilton. You know, because once it's a wartime footing, the generals are going to be running things essentially from his point of view. And so he completely, from that date, which is somewhere in the summer of 1798, these letters go back and forth between uh, Washington and Adams. Washington does come to Philadelphia at the end of that year, 1798. Actually, there's another yellow fever challenge in Philadelphia in that year, as there was in 1793. But he, he and he's there, you know, meeting with uh, Pickering, the Secretary of State, as well as uh, as well as uh, Hamilton. They're, you know, they're designing uniforms, they're figuring out the different ranks, they're trying to figure out how many officers from each state, uh, where they're actually going to be stationed once they build this army. You know, it, it really remains a paper army for most, most of this, this problem. There's a really lovely scene, though, in that Adams uh, movie, the miniseries movie, which I've mentioned a couple times, that John Adams and Hamilton are, are in the same room and Hamilton is talking about the uniforms that he's designing for this army. And then, and then he, he talks about, you know, that we can use this army to liberate Latin America essentially and create our empire. You know, Hamilton has got these grand designs. So there's rumors of grand designs, of, you know, filibustering and, and creating, getting new territory in the midst of this war. Uh, and Adams just sees this as like appalling ambition. It's like, what is this guy talking about? Uh, and so that rift between Adams and Hamilton is going to be really important because ultimately it's going to lead to, uh, you know, it's going to lead to um, uh, Adams losing uh, his, his bid for the presidency in 1800. But that's a whole different, whole different story. Uh, but at any rate, so Washington has this whole nother career now as a general. So how does it end? Uh, well, basically, Adams uh, sends ministers back to France. And a lot of Federalists are, uh, believe this is an absolute travesty. Now, there had been all kinds of sort of secret diplomacy going on. There had been letters that uh, friends of Washington had been sending him from France, you know, saying that the French really don't want war. We need to find a way to make this, this calm down. The president is receiving, and, and George Washington is sending all this to John Adams. You know, he, he gets the stuff and sends it on to Adams. So Adams is receiving from a lot of different uh, places that, well, the French will uh, accept a minister if you send another one. And that's a huge risk because if Adam sends another minister and they can't get received, it's an absolutely, you know, it makes him look really weak. Uh, and the Federalists are absolutely against Adam sending another minister. But in fact, it's George Washington uh, that convinces Adams that the French really do want peace and sends a series of documents to Adam saying, it's his opinion that the French really don't want war. Take it or take it or leave it. And I think that itself gave Adams the confidence. And Washington also knew that the people of Virginia were adamantly against war. And in fact, they had been making resolutions in the state government of Virginia, which was highly Republican, Jeffersonian Republican, that they were going to um, seize the arms of the state, that they, if we had to go to war with France, that they wouldn't fight. I mean, Washington had a strong sense that Virginia wasn't going to be on board if there was some sort of declaration of war. And so Adams is able to send these peace envoys and secure peace, ultimately, which is probably the only thing he accomplished as president of the United States, keeping the United States out of uh, this war. But I, I, for one, and I've written a long essay on, on John Adams' presidency and why he's not a very good president. There's a lot of reasons for that. It's impressive that he isn't completely drawn in to war ultimately. The fact is, uh, the three quarters of the country didn't want war with France. The whole Jeffersonian Republican Party didn't want war with France, and half of the Federalists didn't want war with France. So I don't know if it's really a profile and courage to do what three quarters of the country wanted you to do in the first place. It never should have gotten that far. Uh, and he was certainly riding that wave of popularity and banging the war drums in 1798. The Alien Sedition Act have to go down in American history as some of the worst pieces of legislation ever written that violated the liberties of citizens and aliens as well. So uh, a, a legacy that has to be dealt with and a presidency that ended in failure.
Uh, what else from Washington? Let's get back to our main man, George, who uh, helps Adams get his head around the need for peace and and, uh, and then spends his last year at Mount Vernon. Yeah, Doug, uh, we have a question that, uh, what did Washington enjoy doing most during his final years of retirement? Uh, this is a good question. What did he enjoy doing most during his final years in, in retirement? And it's very clear. Uh, by this age, Washington is in his last year of life. He's 67 years old. He has stopped uh, doing his fox hunting. He doesn't keep dogs anymore. He doesn't have the stamina. He's not up for it. Um, he is never really fond of entertaining unless they're very close friends. He loves to be around his granddaughter Nellie, who plays this beautiful harpsichord, which we have. You know, I know you've some of you've seen some concerts we've done recently on a great replica of it. Please look online and see those if you haven't. Um, he loves spending time with family, but it's so rare that he's just with family. There's always all these other hangers around, hanging around. What he clearly loves to do, though, is his routines. You know, he's one of these guys who loves a routine, uh, you know, like nobody's business. So. He'll get up in the morning before Martha. He'll creep downstairs in the mansion, in the private staircase there, which is you know completely private. Nobody has access to that other than you know his own enslaved valet and others. Uh, he'll go into his office, his study. He'll get dressed for the morning. He might do a little bit of correspondence. Uh, he might have a little bit of breakfast, well, oat cakes, corn oat cakes, smothered in butter, smothered in, in honey. Um, and then he'll get on his horse, and it's a 20-mile circuit, essentially, to visit the uh, not only Mansion Farm, but the four outlying farms at Mount Vernon, all of his property. And here is where he feels most natural. Uh, as a farmer surveying his lands on horseback, which he loves horse flesh, he's a great horseman, uh, and he does that as much as he can uh, every day uh, when he's here at Mount Vernon. That is his ritual. And he is systematically improving his estate. You know, he's taking care of all the, the challenges that they had had over the years. He's meticulous. He keeps incredible records. He has got to be the greatest farmer of his age. Uh, he has huge ambitions for it and great plans. He can't always execute them um, because it's a challenge working with enslaved labor. Uh, there's obviously a lack of motivation for people who are enslaved to work in the same way that if a free person is working for their own property and Washington recognizes that. And so that, that constant conflict and surveillance that he has to put into place is not, uh, you know, it's not a very effective way to have a complicated uh, plantation uh, regime that he's got going. Because he's using the latest literature from, in uh, from England, you know, uh, which requires crop rotation, which requires all sorts of skills, which requires constant uh, attendance and planning uh, and he can't always get it executed in the way that he imagines it has to be done. Um, you know, in fact, there's a story that one of his formerly enslaved uh, people told uh, years after George Washington was dead, when they asked about George Washington, was he a good master? You know, the kind of questions people, people ask. And the enslaved man said that uh, he just told an anecdote of the general asked, asked, had, had asked him to build a corn crib, so a little shed to house the newly picked corn. Uh, and asked him, you know, you know and, and George Washington rode by, and he saw the corn crib, and he said, you didn't use your plum when you when you made that corn crib. It's crooked. And the slave said, well, there's no, you can't tell that it's crooked. Nobody can really tell that it's crooked. And guess what? It works. It, it houses the corn. It's a temporary little building. And Washington made him rebuild it again, using his level and his plum to make sure that it was perfectly uh, situated. Uh, so Washington was kind of anal you know, about this stuff, and he really wanted it to be done the way he wanted it to be done. So a difficult man uh, to serve under, um, but also, you know, a man that expected that same kind of rigor in his own in his own life, and uh, and had been why he, you know, had 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 survived and won out in so many different difficult situations. So he loved to be on horseback. He loved to be around his estates. But this was his serious profession. He wasn't like some gentleman. A farmer who was just, you know, hands off. He would get down, he would talk to the enslaved people himself. He wasn't always working through his overseers. And there's a lot of Virginia planners who didn't do that at all. In fact, uh, uh, you know, there's some other famous ones that we think of as, as great farmers who really were more gardeners and who, who very had little uh, interaction with the field hands who worked out in the, in the broader fields. Uh, but Washington wasn't one of them. So uh, how about another question, Matt? 
But Cynthia would like to know, as George Washington grew older in retirement uh, and had more time to reflect on his life, what regrets did he have? Well, I mean, I think I talked a little bit about slavery, and he had, and this he was quoted as saying his one regret was the people that he depended upon uh, and slavery, not being able to find a, a way out of it um, personally. And, you know, uh, from a cynical point of view in the 21st century, we might be like, oh, well, all you had to do was free your slaves. In reality, it was much more complicated from him from the way he understood what his responsibilities were, not only to his not only to the enslaved themselves, but to his own family, to the dower uh, uh, owners of those slaves, and to the law, and to Virginia society. And so he, he, he probably overthought it a little bit, but he, and he couldn't find a way out until that will. Um, so that was certainly a big regret of his. You know, it's hard to say, you know, other than that, I mean, Washington was not what we would call entirely, he, he didn't allow us to see his reflections very often. He doesn't write an autobiography. You know, he had the motto that the uh, Exodus Act of Probat, uh, which is the result is the test of the action. He's not the kind of guy like Benjamin Franklin who writes an autobiography that sort of whitewashes his life and tries to present it in a certain light. He's not like John Adams who's going to spend his time writing letter after letter complaining about the way he was treated, complaining about Mercy Otis Warren's history of the revolution and how it didn't give him enough credit, complaining to Benjamin Rush about how stupid George Washington actually was and how everybody's going to think that someday in the future that Franklin struck the ground with his staff and electricity shot out of it and George Washington appeared and the two of them won American independence. Washington's not a whiner like that. So he doesn't write those kinds of letters that allow us to see what regrets and frustrations he, he has uh, about his, his broader life. He, he, you know, he says, I've lived the life and you're going to make of it what you will. And he keeps his papers. And his papers, thank God, allow us to understand you know, the founding of our country. This is one of the most important collections of documents to understand the founding of the United States that exists. And it's not just the history of Washington, it's the history of all the enslaved people here as well. We couldn't tell their stories without Washington's papers being done. It's the history of Martha. It's the history of uh, social history in this region, of consumption patterns, of, uh, of productivity, of labor and, and politics and ideas and, and transatlantic flows of information and knowledge. It's an extraordinary resource. It's available for you for free on Mount Vernon's website. You can go and explore George Washington's writings to your heart can, heart's content. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I urge you to go do it and try to tell me what you think his regrets were uh, towards the end of his, his life. It's a great question to ask because we all have them. Uh, and you know, some people let them take over and some don't. But Washington was, I think, a more practical-minded man who was always looking at the future, despite recognizing the value of these papers. Now, I do wonder to what extent you know he called these papers that he kept here at Mount Vernon, or had time to call them and take out things that he thought were embarrassing, or, or take out, or, or to what extent Martha was able to do some of that after his death, or even his secretary, Tobias Lear, who had access to his papers after his death. Because, you know, there's a period in his life where we don't know very much about. So here, here's a great example. So this is volume number seven in this extraordinary collection of the Colonial Series, January 1761 until June 1767. Okay, by my math, that's basically six years, right? So six years, and you got... You know, you got, what is it? You basically got 500 pages worth of printed letters for six years. Whereas um, George Washington's retirement period, so another period where he's not the president of the United States. Here you have January to September 1798. Uh, okay, so this is almost a year as opposed to six years. And the retirement volume on top is, is bigger. Uh, now, of course, he's a more important man and has international correspondence and all that. But the reality is a planter in Virginia of his size in the 1760s, he's in the House of Representatives. I mean, he's not an unknown guy. Uh, he, he's involved in a lot of things. There's missing letters from the colonial period of George Washington's life. It's a gap uh, that I wish that we could discover what was going on there. You know, a lot of his uh, letters and correspondence to his British uh, merchants is missing. Uh, the great firm of, uh, of Robert Carey and Company, 
the letters of, I'd love to find the, the firm letters of Robert Carrot and Company. They had Virginia planner relationships going back into the 17th century. Uh, you know, so, so there's things that are missing in Washington's story that as you know more and more, those gaps seem, seem that much more intriguing. Um, you know, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, you know, Washington uh, does, there is a lot that he's given us. And I think one of the great stories that we should certainly get to before we wrap up, Matt, it's his death. Um, uh, everybody dies. Uh, that is the story of life. And, and I think his death, the story of his death is really popular because, um, because we all experience it. I mean, it's, and it's something that, you know, is very human. It's one way to really get the real man, which, you know, it's always a challenge here. So was there a question on that? Yeah, go ahead. That line, yeah. Um, so Julie would like to know, um, you know, what kind of toll did the war and presidency take on George Washington's health? And, and did that impact his retirement? What kind of toll did his active life take on his health? And did it affect his retirement years? First off, he almost died in his first year as president of anthrax, if you can believe it. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he had a terrible time of it for a couple months there. And it looked like the whole experiment in democracy would go with him. And Washington, you'll remember, came from short-lived males in his line. His father had died in his early 40s. His brother had died in his 30s. His father's father had died young as well. And George Washington always said, I'm going to die young. And he didn't even think he would live to be in his late 50s. He also said that living in cities was terribly bad for his health. You know, and I think that what he didn't know about germs and the way that they're circulating in cities is something that uh, we know, of course. And and, uh, and Washington really felt that living in New York and Philadelphia shortened his life. One of the reasons he gave up power after two terms is he felt he was he wasn't going to make it much longer. He, he his mind was going, his vision was bad, his hearing was terrible, and he was done essentially. And that he always attributed to the lack of you know, having access to the exercise that he was used to as the manager of a farm. And so getting back outside on horseback, uh, dealing with you know, his daily life rather than the, you know, the city life uh, was, was something he very much believed was important to him. So Doug, there's time for one more question. Uh, this one is from Emily. Um, do you have a favorite story about Washington? Emily asks, do I have a favorite story about Washington? Now, look, people, I've been talking to you straight with no notes about George Washington for how many hours together since this shutdown occurred. And I've given you story after story, all of which are, are, are favorites of mine. And I try to come up with one that I haven't talked about. It's kind of remarkable. I have a lot of uh, favorite stories I like to tell about George Washington and uh, his education. You know, I, I was greatly honored to be the founding director of this library we're in here back in 2013. And I learned a lot then about the story of Washington's reading and how important it was to him. Um, but one story uh, that I think is really uh, fun, because uh, it's about a, a young George Washington. He's 16 years old. He's the same age as my son is right now. He's living here with me in Mount Vernon. Uh, an extraordinary young man himself. But George Washington, you know, really takes it to another level. And so one of the great things about that young Washington, here is his, uh, his, his first journal. One of the first things produced by the papers of George Washington uh, once they started publishing papers in the 1970s. And I love it uh, because it is uh, uh, the associate ed edited by uh, Donald Jackson, the great editor of the papers for many years, but also the associate editor was Dorothy Tuohy, who was one of my mentors actually at the University of Virginia. I took a class with Dorothy on, on documentary editing, uh, actually working in the Culper spy letters when I was an undergrad uh, at UVA back in the 90s. And Dorothy went on to become the editor in chief of the Washington papers. Uh, but it's, it's really extraordinary, uh, this book here. Um, the administrative board of the Papers Project back then has the president of the University of Virginia, uh, David Shannon, and it has Mrs. Thomas Turner Cook, who was the regent of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association right there. That shows that partnership uh, that helped create this extraordinary uh, product for scholarship. But George Washington's first diary in here uh, is a trip that he makes as a 16-year-old going out on a surveying mission. And he goes with George William Fairfax, his dear friend, who actually is about 10 years older than him. He's 16 years old. 
and he goes on a uh, on a trip uh, really into what we think of now as like the Shenandoah Valley. But for George Washington, this is, let's see, so it's uh, it's got to be 1748, right? He's 16. He's born in 1732, 1748. He's going out with a surveying party into the wilderness, essentially. And once they get out beyond the pale of civilization, there's this lonely house in the woods uh, that, they, that they reach. And all the guys in this camp group, and these are woodsmen, you know, men's men who are used to the frontier, and they're out there with all their baggage. And they sleep under the stars around a campfire. Washington, 16-year-old gentry class guy that he is, he goes into the house, and he lays down on a bed. He takes off, he starts taking off his clothes, lays down in this filthy bed, which has a blanket on it, which he describes as being covered in lice and fleas and ticks and all kinds of nastiness. And he you know, immediately throws it off, puts his clothes back on, runs back outside, and then, and then you know, sleeps outside. What's interesting about this story is he writes this in his journal. And he writes it in such a way that shows that he looked like an idiot to all these. So he's out there with all these grown men. And he have this rube, his first time out west, and he makes a rookie mistake. You know, he goes in there and he gets undressed, gets under this filthy, lousy uh, blanket. And then he runs back out and he writes in his journal, you know, that he slept outside with the, not being such a good woods, woodsman as the other men, I made this mistake. But as you'll see going forward, I never made that mistake again which is remarkable. He writes this in his journal about, you know, I made this mistake and I never would do it again, as you would see. I mean, who does that? He's a 16-year-old. I mean, it's an incredible self-awareness and a desire to do things the right way and to improve himself. You see that he's got that at such an early age. And it's a small, small story to tell, but he becomes such a great man and so out of proportion you know, such a transhistorical figure. He's such a block of marble. This boy, you know, 16-year-old boy, that tells us a lot more about some made-up stories about cherry trees and about who this guy would become because he had that inner drive to perfect himself, be better, but also the self-awareness to sort of keep track of it. It's like, dear diary, I looked like an idiot, but don't worry, I never did that again. I mean, who is this guy? So anyway, George Washington, his journals are filled of all sorts of remarkable insights into the man. I do want to mention one as well as we sign off the most recent publication in partnership uh, with the papers of George Washington, the Washington Family Papers, George Washington's Barbados Diary. First time it appears. All that appears in that first volume is a facsimile of it that you can't read. It's a terrible, you know, you know, it's 1970s photography of a blurry uh, handwritten document that makes no sense because it's a logbook. Uh, but it, it is George Washington at age 19, the only thing that exists of his writing in that period in time when he goes to Barbados and really discovers uh, what an alien world looks like uh, to the young Virginia. All right, so let me wrap it up here and say thank you all for your attention. Please uh, spread the word about Mount Vernon and all the work we're doing here. Subscribe to our, our channels, like these videos, uh, and thank you so much for being a part of who we are. Uh, we got to hold fast in this challenging time and work together to try to find solutions. Uh, I know that a lot of us have experienced challenges in our lives, family members who are ill. I hope that these Mount Vernon excursions can help you get a little bit out of your own head occasionally uh, and learn something that you didn't know and participate now as a community that we're building of folks who come together with our shared enthusiasm for the 18th century and the great legacy that we all have inherited. Uh, so thank you very much for being a part of it. And I look forward to seeing you back here again soon.